Welcome to Stories We Love. Stories We Love is about stories we love, where I get to talk to really cool, interesting, brilliant people who are doing things that are good for the world. And today I get the distinct pleasure to interview Dr. Elaine Ingham, who um, is a, a teacher and, a, and I believe you started Soil Food Web, which is a really cool website about how important our soil is. And I've been just watching every video on there. I'm so fascinated. I don't know this much about it, except for I am fascinated and I love nature so much. So that's why I wanted to bring you on because Dr. Elaine, you're from what I've seen, you're freaking brilliant. And, um, and I love the, one of the things that I've seen that I love so much is how you look at how each aspect that is happening in a, in the soil has a purpose and that there's not, you know, it could be an invasive species or it could be a, a, a fungus and they each have some kind of purpose that is a communication to either the soil itself or to us to pay attention. So please share, can you share more about that or tell me anything else that you want to start with? <laughs> There's so many places we could go with this. Yeah, but um, I really like that. I like to emphasize to people that it's mother nature speaking to us when something is going on in a plot of land or an area of the earth's surface. And it really is up to us to figure out what she's trying to tell us. Um, it's important. It's we've got to start paying attention or who, you know, Mother Nature is going to say, who needs them? <laughs> we need her, but she does not need us. You know, we should, um, what happened back in the uh, dinosaur time where, you know, all these big animals and wouldn't one of them have worked pretty well? But obviously they weren't doing what Mother Nature wanted them to do. And so, boom, gone. It took, you know, 40,000 years for them to actually finally disappear, but um, they're gone. And she could do the same thing to us without much effort at all, because we've been helping to destroy what nature's largesse is for us. And so we've got to go back to listening and, and trying to understand. And I think that's one of the big things that I've done is try to understand how the soil food web works with the plant, works with the other organisms, and how do we maximize the things that are important to human beings, like food quality, water quality. We have to stop eating poisons because we would live a lot longer if we didn't do those things. But it's they've been put over on us where, oh, and don't worry about these little particle granules of of material, they won't hurt you. Yes, they will. They're slowly but surely dissolving the connections of your right. brain to your head or whatever it is they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> sort can of. You, can let me just back up a little. I didn't mean to interrupt, but for people who don't know why you call it the soil food web, let me see if I got it because <laughs> this is so interesting. You know, I think we hear about the food chain and how humans are at the top of the food chain, and you're saying it's not a chain it's a web and it starts with the soil but you can elucidate us more well you you start with dirt for example and now we're gonna in a lot of instances we'd say we'd regenerate but well what if it, that's the way you know this piece of property has never gone through the successional process it wouldn't be regeneration it would be we were building the soil um and so when you first start building the soil, the, fir the first thing that you've got to do is get a certain amount of the um, particles in that completely individual sand, silt, clay, rocks, and pebbles. No soluble nutrients. There's not a plant on the planet that could grow under those conditions. And so how do you start these organisms to begin the process of converting all that dirt into soil? And so in comes a few bacteria that are um, capable of fixing nitrogen. They're photosynthetic. They can start to make the sugars and the proteins and the carbohydrates and stay alive. And so pretty soon you've got lots of different species of these kinds of organisms. 
and you move into the lichens and the mosses, they start to grow because now there's finally enough energy. And then when that um, part of the succession is moved on up and we have a few small plants that are starting to grow in there. And so now we've got fungal foods, finally. Bacteria are just, you know, overwhelming. We've got 15,000 individuals of bacteria per gram of soil. And uh, the what happened, you know, everything's getting bogged down in these big layers of moss or big layers of um, dead um, algae or dead bacteria because there's nothing there to decompose it. So that's one of the next steps that have to come along, but you've got to have the little, it's understanding all these things that have to be there that have to start working together or you can't progress to where we as human beings would be able to survive. So we've got to have the, the um, plants in the system to provide that um, cellulose so that the fungi can start to grow in that um, material and decompose along with the aerobic bacteria they can start to decompose all these what well, we might call them waste products but they're food for fungi they're food for bacteria and now we get some nutrient cycling going because one of the groups that's going to be finally able to survive and get going in here lots of bacteria so we're going to get bacterial predators and there's not just one kind of bacterial predator. There's um, two different kinds of, of uh, protozoa. You've got, um, well, actually you have three. So the anaerobic variety, ciliates, well, there's a good clue that there's something wrong in your soil from a human's point of view. Because the our food all requires very aerobic conditions. So if you're seeing a lot of ciliates in your soil, you better start worrying about uh, it's going anaerobic and that that better not happen. Um, what, is, what is a ciliate? A ciliate is a protozoan. It's a one cell organism. So you got to have a microscope to see it. Um, they're really cute critters. They run around. They're just like little race cars zooming all over looking for bacteria. And they have little cilia on their outside. That's how they manage to get around. It's like Think back to you, you mean hairs hairs right um and but they're fairly long cilia most of the time and they operate the way in a, a roman galley would have operated with oars and so all of those cilia are working together to really cause this ciliate to be able to zoom and as it's going it's mowing down the bacteria and consuming it those bacteria. Well, the nutrient concentration in bacteria is too high for the ciliates or the amoebae. That's another kind of protozoan or flagellates. The flagellates and the amoebae are aerobic for the most part. And so they're telling you that things are good if that's what you're seeing. Ciliates are telling you, uh, uh, uh oh, something's wrong, compaction, waterlogged too much food that not decomposed previously. So all of those kinds of problems are immediately, you're capable of seeing that something's going wrong and you need to fix it. There's that message from mother nature. We just have to learn to interpret it. So we can also start having nematodes come into the system and there are bacterial feeding nematodes and there are fungal feeding nematodes. So now we have something that's going to prey upon the fungi as well as on the bacteria. So you see, this is a web, isn't it? We've got this connection and that connection, and there's this other connection and it goes over there. And then we can put microarthropods in the system and they eat mostly fungi, but sometimes bacteria. And they'll also eat the protozoa. If possible, they'll eat the nematodes. So now we, from the micro aggregates, we can, uh, or micro, um, uh, um, yeah, right. Uh, micro arthropods. Phew, I love it when the brains just kind of goes on. It's okay. Uh, my brain is down there, down the road, and, and my mouth is still going. And I <laughs> sometimes <laughs> do that. Of what was I talking about? Um, 
So the microarthropods, um, eventually uh, macro arthropods will come along that you can see with your eyes. And what's but an example of a macro arthropod? Um, gosh, uh, a lot of different kinds of, well, um, they're, they're, they're the things that when you're going to go watch an, an alien space opera, <laughs> <laughs> they are the organisms that are always used to make really scary aliens and um, you know remember you know the where the big mouth and he opens the mouth and uh out comes another mouth that's just you know more nasty looking and then that one opens its mouth and something else real nasty comes out so it can grab things that a whole a lot, you know, really, really different. So micro arthropods and macro arthropods are, go have some fun today Googling them. Because yeah, it's, absolutely. yeah, the people don't pay them much attention unless you're looking at something like aphids or, um, so an aphid would be a macro arthropod. One of the bad guys, of course, it's a message from mother nature telling you that the immune system of this plant is not turned on. And what have you been doing to prevent that plant from having its defenses up and going? This is not a healthy soil. This is not a healthy condition. We it, have to learn to interpret things correctly. Yeah, I love that. I love the listening because nature, nature is such a great teacher in general. I mean, and the abundance, like 15,000 bacteria in a gram of soil, that's that's so abundant, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just the, the, like, you're talking about the web, the way it all correlates. And I think part of what happens in conventional um, agriculture that gets in the way is that it's looking at one aspect of something, oh, we have this issue, and we're going to eradicate this issue. But then you, you're not taking into account the, the life force of that lives underneath the soil and that is creating either an imbalance in the soil or an imbalance in the plant or a balance. So I think that is something, you know, just the complexity and the innovation of those um, space opera uh, arthropods, are, it's like so fascinating. Like what is the mind that comes up with these <laughs> diverse creatures, right? Yep. And there's some really amazing ones out there and you kind of go, who thought that one up? It's right. yeah, Mother Nature did. So, okay, we're going to go with the flow. We're going to learn what this organism means for us as human beings in production of uh, um, better plants, plants with more nutrients in it, plants that their immune system has been turned on. You can't turn on the immune system of plants unless all of the nutrients have been taken up by the plant that it requires. It won't turn that immune system on until everything else that it needs itself has been brought to and used by the plant. Now it can turn on its immune system. Well, so there are experiments in the chemical um, journals that, that say, we put out this plant and we put out this plant and we doubled or tripled the um, something or another and no, none of the organisms in the soil can survive the inorganic fertilizers. They're all salts. They take water away from your organisms. The organisms die first because they're, they're smallest. They're, they've got to have that drop of water every 20 minutes and, or they're going to die. Um, the plant can go a little bit longer without that resuscitation, but um, we've got to learn um, how to interpret that information and uh, put it back together. Um, so, you know, when that aphid comes into, well, Mother Nature, before the aphids step of Mother Nature's uh, shaking her finger at us, there's a couple before that typically she starts real simple, real minor information of the things aren't going too well, like you wouldn't find enough fungi in the soil. 
And so that's going to trigger not enough of certain kinds of nutrients are going to get into this plant. Um, and uh, another way Mother Nature might remove all of the um, predators of the bacteria and fungi because there's not enough food getting to them. And that means we don't have nutrient cycling anymore. The plant can't get that set of nutrients any longer. And at that point, Mother Nature might send in the aphids or you know, grasshoppers or other insects like that would, would be something that she would choose to send in to let you know that if you don't pay attention to me, you're going to be in deep doo-doo. So or, start paying or attention. Of, or lack of deep doo-doo. <laughs> yep. I mean, in terms of the, because I think we talk about something called the poop loop. Can you explain what that means? And I don't even like that word, but with the loop part added, it goes. It goes <laughs> you can see well. why students put that one together. I call it the soil food web, you know, doing its job. <laughs> they called it the poop loop because when the plant starts growing, when it germinates and starts to grow, it's got to put exudates out of its root system in order to wake up specific bacteria and fungi to start supplying the plant with all the nutrients that it needs. So the plant will put out this exudate if it needs these five or six nutrients, or it'll put out a different exudate if it requires one or two other kinds. And so it's a message directed at very, very specifically at certain fungi and bacteria that will make the enzymes to be able to pull those nutrients out of the sand, silt, clay, rocks, pebbles, out of the organic matter. There is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants. And yet, why are we being told that we can't feed the world if we don't use inorganic fertilizers and pesticides? It's just a complete and total lie. Well, you know, if you're completely oblivious to how mother nature does things you might think that well this is the only thing we can do but take a step back watch the world around you that's not how nature functions she gets all these um, organisms going in the soil so they're pulling those nutrients into their bodies into the bacterial and fungal bodies organic nutrients but your plant still can't take them up the next step has to be there and that means the bacteria have to be eaten by their um, predators. The fungi have to be eaten by their predators so that the stored nutrients in the bacteria and fungi are released into, as the predator chows down and eats, it's re releasing those nutrients in a soluble form. So that's, so why, the, that's the food cycling, that's the nutrient cycling. And yep. that's what you call it. And students have called it the poop loop. Well, one more step that I have to explain. And okay, great. so when you look at the predators, it's because the nutrient concentrations in the bacteria and fungi were so much higher than or are so much higher than what the um, predators require that they have to get rid of the excess through their poop. So poop loop because what comes out from these microorganisms are the nutrients that your plant requires. It's not pooped to the plant. It might be pooped to the bacteria or fungi or something else. But nevertheless, we're releasing those nutrients and the plant takes up what it needs. And it's getting all of the nutrients it requires in the right balances. So you know, how many nutrients does your plant require? It's, you know, people argue about that all the time, but it, it's in the 30 to 40 different nutrients and you have to have them all or you're not going to be able to function. So. And how do you get, like for somebody that wants to, um, let's say plant something on their property, what? how do you get that? Is that from compost? Is it from other animals like we have deer and coyotes and owls and things like that where I live. Um, Mostly it's from decomposition of the organic matter. So like in the fall when you cut your plants down and you let them lie on the surface of the soil, let them lie. 
because the microorganisms from the soil, if you've got a good food web, if it's healthy soil, you've got all the organisms that can come up. And in just a couple of weeks, they'll get most of that residue material decomposed and converted back into soil. Look at all the nutrients going into that soil. Yes, we take nutrients out of our agricultural fields, fields and take them to market and sell them, but it's not a large component of what's in that field. Just having the bacteria and fungi chewing the, um, chewing the sand seals, clays, rocks, pebbles, parent material, uh, and releasing nutrients in the form of sand, silt, and clay. And ah, oh, it's a massive amount of nutrient in each one of those grains of sand and each one of uh, the clays, each one of the um, silts that are present in that soil. So it's a constant replenishment process. And the water that moves through in the rainy season, all the soluble nutrients will be taken out of that water and stored in the soil right around the surface of your plant. So the bacteria and fungi, again, are holding those nutrients in their bodies through the winter period so that we don't lose things. We don't have leaching if you've got good biology in the soil. If it's healthy soil, you have to have those organisms in there, though you, you can't hold all the nutrients that, let's say, a corn plant would need or uh, blueberries. You have to have at least, and these are bare minimums, you've got to have 135 micrograms um, per gram of bacteria in the soil. So 135. You need at least 135 micrograms of fungal biomass per gram of soil. You've got to have 10,000 um, protozoa in that soil per gram. And you've got to have at least 100 of the nematodes, preferably the bacterial feeding and the fungal feeding and the omnivorous and the root feeding nematode eaters. You have to have all of those in your soil if you're even going to begin to hope that these processes can go on without any consequences to the human beings. Yeah, and that's why you say you need a microscope. That's right. And you need a microscope, you're saying to, do I have 135 of the bacteria? Do I have 135 of the fungi, the fungi and, and 10,000 of the protozoa? protozoa. Okay, yeah, so you're saying this is, I've got, a, I've got to look at a gram of soil and maybe take a few grams from different parts of your land and check this gram and see, count, you're counting these creatures, so you have to look them up to know what they look like. And that's um, what we do at the Soil Food Web School, is we teach people how, what these guys look like. You don't have to take things down to genus species, not necessary. It's functional group. So we're counting most of the bacteria that, you know, and you're not going to count, actually count 135 of them. You're going to dilute the sample down. So you know you've diluted it by a factor of 50 or a factor of 10. And then you can just count a small part of that drop. Uh, so you, you see 15 bacteria in this field and 14 bacteria here and 12 here and 21 and but when, by the time you get the mean and standard deviation it's really nice and tight data so you would look at that okay i diluted i've got on average 15 bacteria per field um, i diluted by this much so i'm going to multiply by a thousand fold um, and i'm up above uh, 135 micrograms of bacterial biomass per gram of soil. We do all the math for people. So you plug in your raw data, the, the, um, uh, the, the spreadsheet does its magic, and there you are. Here's the number of protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, et cetera. That's so fascinating. Um, with regard to the microbiome that's in soil, is what you're talking about the microbiome or is it something different or is it just the bacteria or is there something more that makes the microbiome of soil well people would probably include include the plants the typical 
um, plants above ground. And of course, the microorganisms in the soil influence which of those plants are going to be healthy, which can survive. So it really is it's a part of that community. You can't separate the above ground part of a plant from the below ground part of the plant. And we've got all these organisms in the on the surfaces above ground. We've got these different sets of organisms present and functioning on the soil. So the whole system has to work together. Um, and so the biome that we're talking about is these the whole system, not well, and you have to go to and look at the birds and the insects and all of it together is the biome. And uh, what we see is if we get outside of the biome, when we take compost, for example, where we're trying to grow all of the different species of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, and all of that. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I kid the students in our in our school that they can't graduate until they can whip off all of the <laughs> <laughs> organisms like I just did. But you get you get it. It's just a it's a fun exercise. Yeah, uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, we we need to laugh sometimes and oh, we, hello. Yeah, or we would get really grim all the time. Yeah, so, no, yep. no grimness, no grimness. Yep. So, so we, saying, yeah, so this is so interesting. Keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt, but this is so fascinating. Um, so it, we know what the community should look like in the in this biome. When you go beyond that biome, when you take this material from biome number one and you go to biome number two, you don't get the responses that you would have gotten if that handful of soil was back in biome number one. There's so much difference in biome number two that it's a complete, not, it's not completely, but there is a significantly different set of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes because of some mixture of the climate, the, you know, time that the, the sun actually shines on the ground, the, the cold that you have in the winter time, the, uh, the, the quality of the water that you've got in that biome. So it's, you've got to kind of stick in your biome or you're going to have trouble growing the plants. Yeah, and that's, I think, similar in humans. If you replace somebody's microbiome with somebody else's microbiome, they're not going to be as, unless, I don't know for sure, but I think from what I remember reading that the other person who has the new microbiome, it's not as right for their body, their brain, their health as it was for the first person, if if both were, let's say, healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's so fascinating. So, so I live in California um, and I live in an area of California that can be a little um, tricky with regard to fire. So are there... It sounds to me that when your soil is healthy and your plants are healthy, it's potentially less fire. Um, less likely to burn. Yeah, less fire. likely to burn. Yeah. Yep. So can you because you've got the water held in the soil and the plants aren't suffering from not having enough water. It's one of the things we've done with our agricultural land, our um, urban areas, suburban areas. We've treated it all really badly. We've killed all these organisms. There's nothing to build structure. So if you've got compaction in your soil, that's a sure giveaway that your, your property is going to burn pretty fast if a fire goes by. So we've destroyed the structure. We've got to get that back into the soil which means we've got to have the whole food web be re-inoculated into that area. And a lot of people just put a layer of mulch, uh, compost maybe below that, um, put an extract down, uh, a compost extract down into the soil to try and get the, those organisms to rebuild the structure and hold the water, keep the soil aerobic because you've got airways and passageways and hallways to allow all of that to happen. So that's what you're saying is something that people can do is they put compost and then they put mulch 
and that's going to help reconstitute the soil and the soil like the, how does the water get into the soil is it from rain or is it from watering or what's the any of the above any way you can get water on that now you often have to be careful of what you're applying in the water that you're getting from the you know water plant because they're using chlorine and chloramine to sterilize the the water right. as it comes to you and so we shouldn't be drinking that because we have biomes in our digestive system that are unique to us and you don't want to be losing them or think of the, all of the effort you had to go through to eat all the right kinds of foods to get your biome to work again. You know, every time you go through a round of um, constipation and then diarrhea and then constipation, if that's your body's trying to say to you, hey, you don't have the right microorganisms in here. Now go eat um, uh, some yogurt or go out and eat a salad. Well, okay, but they they killed the insects on that salad with glyphosate. So glyphosate is pretty much uh, a sterilant. And so you just wiped out your digestive system again. Right. And then I, I heard that one round of antibiotics, which a lot of doctors kind of distribute very easily. I was actually on antibiotics as a child from fourth grade until about 22 years old, tetracycline four times a day for my skin because nobody understood, you know, the the microbiome. And I heard just one round of microbiome, I mean, one round of antibiotics for like two, two, um, two weeks can destroy your microbiome for like a year. So you've mm -hmm. got to keep building up your microbiome. And so what you're talking about with regard, it's it's similar with the soil. And it's so fascinating, like glyphosate, you know, they're losing Monsanto, who makes it, I believe, is losing cases because people are getting non-Hodgkin's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then I saw on one of your on one of your videos where you had three people, I think, uh, beside you. So you and three other people, one of the people said that um, he was creating a device that could measure the nutrients in soil with a, a laser, I think is what he said. And he said something like um, one carrot that's grown in a in a healthy way, regenerative, biodynamic, organic, let's say, and would have the same amount of nutrients as 30 pounds, I believe he said, or 260 carrots the same amount of nutrients you'd have to eat 30 pounds of those carrots to get the nutrients in the one carrot and i i say this all the time but i really believe part of the problem in america with obesity is because there's no nutrients in conventional food so when people eat it their body is going wait give me food give me food and so they're still hungry and they have to eat food because there's no nourishment yep so you're not getting the potassium that you have to have so your body says feed me feed me feed me and so you throw some more in you you don't know that that response is i've got to have exactly what my i have to listen better we have to understand that we need to look at your gut biome and say uh, you don't have this kind of protozoan in there and so it's impossible for you to have enough potassium to be healthy so using the biology in your microbiome is going to tell you whether you've got the nutrients there or not yeah that's that's so right on and i think when you're growing food in the way that you're talking about where the soil is healthy or plants or trees or um things like that when you're growing food like that you know it's going to have the nourishment and i believe and just correct me if i'm wrong does the food when you're eating food that's grown in a rich soil with a perfect you know the balance of the protozoa and the amoebas and the bacteria and the fungi and the erythropods and somebody else nematodes um when you <laughs> thank you um, when you have the soil um in that way is the plant taking are you eating microbiome from a healthy plant in a way mm -hmm. yeah because the whole surface of that carrot has all those microorganisms on it 
And it's exactly the biome we need. It's exactly those organisms we got to get back into our digestive system. So as you're munching on that carrot and getting all the nutrition, you're also getting these beneficial bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes, and you're chowing down on them. So you're getting so much benefit from one piece of, of one carrot. Um, and then we destroy it all by drinking a glass of unpurified water. Yeah, I have um, a water purifier in my house and on my shower because you also have microbiome on your skin and the chlorine in, in municipal water can eradicate it, you know, and so you don't want that. Um, then we have a microbiome in our mouth and I think we probably have them in our sex organs and we probably have them in every other place because they're so key. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to have these bacteria and there's a microbiome I heard in the air. So even when you're breathing in, you're breathing in bacteria, viruses, germs, whatever in that are healthy, hopefully, um, and that are and that you're needing and that if you're breathing in fresh air, it seems to me like you're going to have, um, you know, it's going to enhance your own immune system, yep. because it's getting a diversity of new bacteria everywhere you go every breath you take. Yep. And you build a layer of these beneficial organisms that can outcompete the disease causers. So right. You know, you breathe in some COVID virus, and if you've got, if you're healthy, you've got good coverage of all that good biology, you're not going to succumb because the virus cannot get to the surface of you because that layer of microorganisms are preventing that virus from being getting anywhere close to your Thank skin, you. to your Thank surface. You. Yeah. <laughs> Please keep growing. You know? Yeah. So yeah, I, I scratch my face and so I better get that back on. Uh, you know, because I accidentally used well something that killed the organisms. So we've only begun to understand all of this. It's yeah just amazing the amount of work that we're gonna need to so do all of this. So would you suggest that we don't wash our produce? If, if in fact, you know, it's going to have a microbiome on it. Yep. Or just a light rinse, um, get the big chunks off. It, it's not enough to disturb the um, set of organisms that are more or less glued to that surfaces. Oh. All of the bacteria make glue and the fungi, then they grow as long threads. So they're holding everything together on the sur surface it's of that cute, cute if you need to if you need to wash it if it's not mm -hmm. yeah okay that's that's fascinating um yeah because like with my hands especially like during the whole pandemic i never ever ever used alcohol those alcohol sanitation things because it's going to kill the microbiome mm -hmm. and i I love my, I love my microbiome. <laughs> I, I work very hard to keep this microbiome. Yeah, um, this is so fascinating. And so let's say, you know, let's say there are places in, you know, all over the world that are needing more uh, green, more ground cover, more, um, more healthy soil. So is that the basic recipe is, um, the compost with the mulch or is there something more there's a variety of different ways of applying that microbial community so we can run it through um, irrigation as long as you get rid of the chlorine and chloramine before you add the microorganisms into that you also want to be aware of 90 degree um, turns in any of the piping, because if you're going at a reasonably high pressure to get all things, everything moving through that um, into your uh, containers. It's gonna hit them and they're gonna die on the way up. Right, because think about you know any kind of pressure, here's the curve coming along here and here's the flow of the microorganisms. If it, the pressure's too high, they're just gonna go smack Right. And it's like, think of a uh, dead bacteria and fungal biomass dripping down the, and most of where it ends up landing is over here on this side of, and so you don't know that you've been killing all of your microorganisms. You've got to look at how many, how, what were the organisms that were in the liquid before you ran it through the, the equipment, and then look at what's coming out 
at oh, the other wow. end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, a microscope. Exactly. I and so it's very microscope. easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's very easy to uh, understand uh, the monitoring everything in your uh, that you need. It doesn't take that much time and effort. That's fascinating. And then with regard to the um, so like where I live, I have there's lots of hills. I mean, there's hills and I see bare spots and I see lots of green also, um, mostly like I, I want to say trees and I want to say probably like chaparral or something like that. That's more California native. Mm -hmm. um, what like when it's a hill that you can't walk on, it's like so steep, right? Um, I, like, there's like my house is on three cliffs and then there's cliffs above and everything. and there's trees growing on there and they're usually like California <coughs> excuse me California scrub oak is one of the trees that grows a lot that's that's pretty native right and is yes. that is that a good tree that can help to reconstitute that soil at least around the tree mm -hmm. yep it's it's going to be putting out a lot of uh, exudates into the soil so it's supporting that whole um, biome of organisms the roots should be going down deep 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 really help hold your house on that um, cliffside because uh, you know it's putting its roots down deep and that means that whole um, you know maybe when we're thinking of oak um, some oaks can put their root systems down 100 to 150 feet Wow. Really magnificent, magnificent old oaks. They can put their root systems down to 350 feet. Oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah, so think of the stability it's trying yeah. to get in there. And we need to make certain that we're helping all of that vegetation keep things in place. So a big, heavy torrent of, down, of rain coming down doesn't wash all the soil away and all of a sudden your house is slip sliding down the slope you want to be promoting that beneficial life in the soil that helps your plants do what their plants are supposed to do but how do you get it on you can um if you know that you've got good structure deep 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 down you just put it on you know water it through the hose uh, if you have a sprayer, spray with a hose and get things covered. Generally, we look at the soil in the springtime when you've got rain. So that is, do you have the organisms that you need in here and in the right balances? If the answer is yes, we go, great, you know, there's really no more that we have to do. But let's say you don't have the right balances, then we'll want to come in with an extract where we just extract the organisms um, off of the leaf surfaces, off the plant, the material, the organic material in that compost. Now there, all of that's in the water and it's really easy to spray uh, out. <laughs> we use drones a lot of the time and it's kind of fun to have two or three drones that you're just going back and forth in somebody's yard and you're covering the lawn and then you put in the right tea for the trees and you have them the drones go up and spray the trees and the bushes and the shrubs because they all more or less need the same thing in your flower beds it's a maybe a third kind of extract that we'll have that will help your flowers much earlier succession plants plants and and that means they're all ready set for uh, that drier time of the year. We want to make certain that you've got deep water, that at no time your plants do your plants show that they're running out of water. And if we do see that, then we'll come in and rebuild the um, um, structure of the soil using the bacteria and the fungi, protozoa and nematodes. So uh, you will be much more resistant to the fire because all of your plants have adequate moisture. When a spark lands on one of your leaves, it doesn't cause that leaf to burst into flames. If you're water. Yeah, there's in water the in, in the leaves. In, when you get really, really dry and your plants are all just kind of hanging out saying, please, may the rain come, please, to get all dried out and a single spark can just explode 
into well so much for your house um want to we you know i i, I want to have demonstrations of this and it's uh, yeah. you know, where are you gonna who's gonna volunteer to let their house burn uh, <laughs> right. um the, the, uh, so uh, the other thing is like um there are some places like where i live where my house is built into bedrock so does that mean it's going to be hard for the scrub oaks to get down in that or do they actually go and go deep into it even in bedrock they'll go around um, anything that they can't get their roots into a crack or a crevice but you know most of the bedrock in california has a fair amount of cracks and crevices in it yeah and so you're getting the plants are growing into those cracks and crevices well that's so, so fascinating yeah yeah and then with regard to um you know like do you do consultations or do you just teach you just both or you're teaching your uh, yeah most of the time i'm teaching um you know i i travel a great deal to give i just got back from brazil for example ah. and yeah i love i like brazil a lot yeah um and i will soon be going to southeast asia so i i make the videos i'm usually the one who does the videos i want a lot more of our um senior trainees to take over for me this next time around so i'm not typically the person that is doing the consulting we have gosh i think we're up to about 30 um mentors so people that help the um the general public to understand what they're doing and what we want you to do is look on our look on our website and see all the different places where we have consultants that right. are you know they've been tested they've been checked out they know what they're doing for the most part sometimes they have to call me up and say oh, okay you know how did this work again you know with this plant what's the fungal to bacterial biomass ratio with that and i usually can answer those things um so uh, you work with that consultant that's close to you you want somebody in the same biome if you can because then they know what the weather's been like and so what's going on with the biology on the surfaces of above ground as well as below ground what's the typical way to handle particular problems yeah interesting and then um w when you were talking about the like the compost tea um do you guys sell it or somebody else sell it that you know that you can recommend and by the way your website is at soilfoodweb.com yep okay that's it so yep. we'll make sure that that's there when you say go to the website but the compost tea is that something you sell or is that something one of your mentors sells or how does we that we have a number of people who make the compost and they check it all the time to make sure that it's um, got the right organisms in it and that's why we always want to know what plant are you trying to grow because you know we want to make certain that what we're applying is what's going to help turn on that immune system of the plants so um yeah work with that um, um consultant and they can usually tell you several places that are making really good compost you're pretty lucky in uh southeast the southern part of california there are uh, quite a number of people who are making good compost in that part of the world. Um, some of the places we have problems are like in South Carolina. Um, it's, you know, this is, well, we just don't have enough people down there yet um, understanding and seeing the evidence. So the, you know, so if you yeah. wanna, if you're in South, South Carolina, you probably have to go to the person in Florida or the person up in Virginia to uh, get connected and, uh, they make really good compost they've got to be checking it all the time please ask them for their data so you can see that this is good compost for what you want to have done and they can make the extract they can make the compost tea for you oh interesting uh, you might want to learn how to do that yourself whichever um you know it's going to be cheaper to make it yourself yeah um and then from what I believe, from what I understand, trees that are in good, healthy soil can bring more rain. 
Is that accurate? Can you talk a little bit about that? There's a, a lot of study going on to demonstrate that. And it certainly looks like the data is coming out like that. You need to have shade. You, you want to have cooler air underneath the trees. So it's got to be enough trees that it really drops the temperature in that group of stems. Uh, one tree, well, it helps, but it can't do it itself. So you need you, like a forest or a mini forest or something like that. And then like that, a food forest. Uh, when you say food forest. That means you've got trees in the, that area, but you also have understory plants. You have plants that are very short and um, don't grow very tall, but they're food. Again, everything is food in that forest. And because it's got to be large enough, it does a very good job of cooling. And so you've always got a place to escape to on some of those really hot days. I just can't imagine what it was like this um, summer for all of you living in Southern California. It was just really toasty, wasn't it? A little bit, but I have friends in Dubai and it was more toasty there for them. Um, <clears throat> this is so interesting. So, um, wow. Okay. I love you. Um, I love what you're doing. How can I ask though, like, how in the heck did you figure all this out? Like what, what started you on this path? I probably should ask that at the beginning, but like just your vast amount of knowledge is so impressive and it's so it's so vast over so many areas. How, how did you do that? <laughs> I've, I've basically been working on soil in some way or another um, since I was six years old. <clears throat> My dad was a uh, veterinarian at the University of Minnesota. And uh, he would have me looking at various things. So when I was six years old, my dad taught me how to count E. coli uh, using a microscope. And I just had the greatest fun. It was so cool. So um, I did my master's degree at Texas A&M, uh, where I looked at the microorganisms in the digestive systems of oysters and uh, freshwater mussels. Um, and showed the industry that there was a way that they could continue to make money um, growing oysters, but they had to move their oyster beds out of the contaminated flow from the Brazos River into the, um, uh, in, into the ocean at that point. So um, they, moved, they moved their, their um, and then I went to Colorado State University for my PhD and my advisor, Dr. Donald Klein, um, kind of gave me a, a, a fungal um, project to do. And I found it really interesting and wanted to continue with it on my, uh, for my PhD work. And so then he said to me, go around to all of the soil scientists in here at Colorado State University. So in horticulture and agronomy and soil science and all the different arboriculture, all of those, and talk to them about the importance of microorganisms in the soil, um, because that's what you're going to be working on. And I went around and made an appointment with all of those people, sat down and told them what I wanted to do, and then said something like, do you think that's a good project? And they said, oh, no, no, don't do that. There's absolutely no jobs in that area. You won't be able to do anything with your PhD work because microorganisms just come back. You know, like you burn the prairie and the very next day, all the microorganisms are back. And I was just, did, did no one teach any of these people anything about ecology and responses of organisms? So I kind of took the reverse view and went, I think if I can put together a really good um, research project and show how important these microorganisms are. So I postdoc with um, Dr. David Cole and he took it um, even further. We put together that model of the bacteria and fungi being eaten by protozoan nematodes and you know, all of the 
everything that all the little arrows and things it's kind of looks like a spaghetti bowl but it's um it was a great way to get started and i've been working on that ever since i love your passion it sounds like your relationship with your dad was pretty cool yeah, yeah. Yep. and then my husband is a nematologist oh. so he he's the one who's taught me all about nematodes and identifying and all of that and how they're so important in uh, making certain that the immune system of your plants gets turned on. I love that. And so you basically is your is your are your degrees in like soil micro, microbiology, uh, fungalology? No, it's soil microbiology because I didn't limit myself to just fungi. Right. I also looked at the bacteria and and the protozoa and the nematodes. And so develop that whole, um, you know, model uh, while working as a postdoc for um, Dave Coleman. And then the last thing I want to say is, or ask you about, is thank you for sharing how you got so cool. It's so cool. And uh, thank you to your dad and your husband. Um, it's so cool. The so conventional farming. It causes topsoil to be removed and go into the water with the chemicals in the water, which is one of the reasons why fish might be a little less cute um, as a <laughs> or, or frogs or whatever might have five legs or four legs or yeah, four legs. eyes or whatever. It's, yeah, it's... yeah, extra eyes, extra whatever. Yeah, so yeah. so that we can see through the the creatures in those waters that are getting that topsoil with the conventional stuff that you'll, the aren't you'll, doing so well. You'll see that the microorganisms are dead. There's that that whole level of dealing with problems and you know getting things incorporated into the structure of the sand silt and clay particles, getting things back into um, that by the silica bilayer protected it protecting other organisms from that toxic chemical. They're dead, they're gone. We've overdone it. Um, there's a certain amount that that system can manage, but once you go over that, it's it's dead. Um, and how are you gonna bring that back? Well, right. first of all, we gotta stop allowing all of those toxic chemicals to go into the water. You cannot have leaching. You cannot have run, runoff. You cannot be applying those chemicals to those systems because then you're going to have all of the, you know, the whole distance to the ocean. You've destroyed that what's what should be happening in there. It's gone. Yeah. So the basic understanding that I would have is like if you want to have more rain, less drought um more healthy food it's really to respect the brilliance of nature to find how to cr help create or help support nature in her diverse which is why it's so important for the diversity of people the diverse the diversity of nature to really create the healthy soil with the the soil sponges and with the microbiome and the the whole mix of everything working together specific to that soil and part of what that's going to do is it's going to make it so that the soil absorbs the water Holds you're not going to you're not yeah. going to run off you're not going to have the chemicals because you don't you need the chemicals because when soil is healthy and correct me if i'm wrong but i saw it on your website when soil is healthy it doesn't get the the it doesn't it doesn't need it doesn't get the the stuff that's going to eat it up it's because the, the immune system is turned on, as you were saying earlier, mm -hmm. and so the soil can handle stuff. And it's just like when we're healthy, you know, you breathe in a virus or a bacteria, and it doesn't really have a, a way, a place to to take hold. Yeah. If you're really healthy, exactly. exactly. And so this could help with places like California, where um, we need to get more water. We could do that. What you call the food forest, where you're growing food where you have other plants that are also there and you have a group of trees around it or, or near it that are also attracting the moisture. Is that what you're saying? Yep. You're, because of the condensation that's, that occurs when you have a sharp dif difference in temperature, 
on the outside of that forest, then you get the air moving down in. It really cools and you can have a lot of condensation. And working in the Middle East, uh, in places like Saudi Arabia and Jordan, um, other projects, um, we need to get those swales put in so that we have um, stocks of grasses. When you that, say swales? A swale. Oh, where, oh soil. Oh, sorry, I just heard you wrong. Swale. S-W-A-L-E. No, I heard you totally right and didn't understand it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we, because what you want to do is on the surfaces of the grass plants or other plants that are growing in that area, you want them to act as um, condensation points for that cooled air that now can release some of that water. It's not a lot usually, especially when you first start out, but it's enough to keep those grasses alive. So um, oh, I'm not gonna remember his name, darn, Jeff. Well, I'll try to look it up for you. Um, but showing that they can now have a puddle of water being held in that, um, in that area, in that uh, low, lowest part. And so now there is water being held for the, all of those plants. Uh, where, for example, John D. Liu has been working in a variety of different ecosystems and showing that if you just slow the water down and can set, let it set on the surface of the sand dunes, the water infiltrates instead of being lost. And now you can start to grow trees. You can start to grow shrubs. They're not going to be big, tall things. They're going to be small little things, but every step in the right direction, the people who used to live there, the Bedouins, for example, now they've come back and they are living on tribal lands once again, mm -hmm. instead of you know being poor people sleeping on the streets and things like that. So we, we have to bring things back like that. That's so beautiful. It makes me cry. I've been to lots of places in Africa, including Morocco. And, you know, it's amazing. It's just amazing there. Um, All you. the places that people are working to turn things around. And right now, it's a drop in the bucket. But you got to go through that phase. You've got to show people that it really does work, that you we, we uh, and, and in the work that we've been doing with growers in many places in the world, we've actually had them got, have, they're completely off pesticides. They're completely off inorganic fertilizers. They've rebuilt the structure in the soil. They don't have to work that hard. They're selling their equipment because they don't need it anymore. Mm. And so they figure per, not going to uh, probably not get the numbers quite right because there's too many too much stuff wandering around in my brain most of the time but if i remember correctly todd harrington's clients have saved something like a million dollars per hundred acre farm a million dollars now sitting in their pockets instead of being uh, given away to the chemical companies given away to the um, companies that make large equipment to be able to apply the pesticides and the herbicides and the fungicide, all of those things. We, we don't need it. Right. This is so sexy. Um, <laughs> it's so sexy because it's so, you know, it's about, it's about people really uh, paying attention, listening, which is sexy paying attention, listening, and then responding in ways that are helpful. I love that these people are doing this and that you're doing this. Okay, last, I said it was the last question I lied. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I hope you don't have to catch a plane or anything. No, no, I, I, uh, um, having just got back from Brazil, I'm taking it easy for the next couple of days. Um, and it is Friday afternoon, so um, it's uh, uh, close enough to being off time that I'm just going to go out and catch some rays in my garden. I love that. That's what I do too. I'm, I'm outside every day naked. 
um, getting sun because we have clock genes. We have genes that get turned on by the sun to tell us when to it's time to go to bed, to tell your brain when it's time to start making melatonin. It's freaking genius. Um, the only other, okay, this might be hopefully the only other question. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, Bill Gates, he, I read something yesterday where saying that um, you need to have the GMO seeds. He calls them now magic seeds, which is his euphemism for genetically modified seeds. Nothing and he said, about got, them. yeah, um, you say that, that's right. I think there's magic. It's like everything you're talking about to me is magic in the natural sense. But so he was saying that you've got to do that in order for food security. We can't have food security unless we have uh, commercial pesticides, which I think are made from oil waste products. Is that right? Yep. Yep, all from the petrol petroleum industry. Yeah. Right. So you can't you can't have a, abundance of food without the the petrol fertilizer and petrol um, pesticides and things like that. And that if you don't have these magic seeds, you're not going to get the abundance. Can you can you give us a good understanding of why he is? Um, potentially mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is mistaken because we don't need to have those pesticides used. If you um, get enough nutrient, nutrient cycling going in that soil, the plant's going to be healthy and it's going to be able to raise its own immune system. We don't have to put extra genes in there. We don't have to try to um, hype this poor little plant um, with making that plant send more of its nutrients to some other immune system. It's got everything already inside of its, its DNA. It doesn't need more. Um, what's going to happen when they, they put that plant, sooner or later they will, they'll put that plant in a place that's not right for that plant. Um, what strange things could occur. They haven't tested in all of the different systems, all of the different climates to find out what are all the potential responses when you put those extra, that extra genetic material into that plant. Um, there's, there's too much liability in, the, in that. Um, so I say it's, uh, well, and we've already shown that we don't need to be putting out inorganic fertilizers or pesticides. We're growing um, things large scale. We've got projects going on in Southeast Asia, a Southeast Asia, where we are putting um, compost. We're we're getting the biology out on 150,000 hectares. Nice. So it's completely scalable. It, you just need another windrow. You, we do some special things for each one of the ecosystems that we go into so that um, we're kind of keeping our, uh, a little bit of a secret about what we do. So I can't tell you everything. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I that. yeah. Yep. So, but um, definitely we're going to be able to do this. We just need the um, next, a couple more years to have all the data and show exactly how to do this. Mm -hmm. so, and 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 to show, and to show, um, you know that what I would love, I, I find it so interesting that America subsidizes conventional farmers, and not regenerative, biodynamic, diverse, biodiverse, um, organic farmers. If we took the subsidies away from all farming practices, sorry, no more subsidies. We gotta feed human beings, and we've gotta house them, and we need the money for something else. The, the subs. This, not having those subsidies would break all of those farmers. Yeah, and yeah. The, the natural abundance of, of nature in, in farms that are respecting the brilliance in the soil and the brilliance in the plants and the brilliance in the creatures is, is going to create more abundance. That's my yep. question. Absolutely. We, we see the increases in nutrient concentrations when we get all of the the plants back using mother nature's way of growing. So we increase the quality, the uh, nutrient concentration in that those foods. We increase the amount of production of yield. Um, you, you don't have to um, deal with dirty water because you can cycle your own through your own systems. 
and you're not putting toxic chemicals out any place. So we are not going to have weeds, so you don't have to mow all the time or you don't have to, excuse me, you don't have to till in order to get rid of the weeds. So that's a tenant in the organic universe where it's just not true. They should not be tilling at all. The What they need to do instead is to push that fungal biomass higher and higher so that NH4, ammonium, is the only form of nitrogen or you know, you've got a good balance of nitrate and ammonium so the weeds won't grow. Weeds require pretty much just nitrate. Start shifting some of that nitrate into ammonium and you are weed free. There's uh, work going on over in Japan uh, on that where they're showing that that's what determines whether something's weedy or not. So lots more things to figure out, but we're, we've got a good start. And uh, it's absolutely horrible that Bill Gates is going around saying magic seeds. That's just silly. Okay. Um, I thought it was so um, cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's counting on um, Americans in the United States on being really poorly uh, educated. Right. He's counting on ignorance. He's counting on, on his, um, he's counting on ignorance. And so you're helping eradicate that and to increase the capacity for people to understand the genius, the brilliance, the, um, awe inspiring wisdom of nature, you yeah. know, I mean, it's awe inspiring. It's yep. just <laughs> so interesting and so fascinating and so yep. compelling. Rooted rooted plants have been with us for a billion years right and we managed to feed the world for that you know billion minus 50 years and it's all it's taken us 50 to 75 years to destroy what nature put together so it doesn't it doesn't it just absolutely says something to me that um, nature has, ma has managed to do everything just fine mm -hmm. until we got greedy people mm -hmm. running the business and set, you know, big uh, ads in the Chicago Times or, you know, New York Times or something um, to say it is your um, it's your duty as an American to utilize these um, inorganic fertilizers and the pesticides in order that we can feed our boys coming back from World War II. Wow. And that's where that, that shift really got going. They really pushed um, that, uh, you know, America, and we've got to do this for America, um, that patriotic fervor. Right. And they they tied it together, and people bought it. They never thought. David so it was never. just marketing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting marketing marketing in that passion because those people were heroes, and so we have to. to we've to got to make certain that we we treat them right when they're at home. Right. Right. Well, Doctor Elaine Ingham, I completely. <laughs> I completely, you know, I, I fucking love you. I, I hope I get a hug you sometime. Um, yes, please. Hug. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're just amazing. I love everything that you've just shared with me and taught me. I'm going to go look up exudate, exudates. Exudates, yep. And swale, S-W-A-L-E. I'm going to go look those up. Okay. Exudates as in E-X-U-D-A-T-E-S. Right. I can see it's spelled. I mean, yep. the, my mind, I spell everything in my head. Like I'm a, my mind spells everything. So, but yeah, so I knew that, but, um, but, uh, but swale, I didn't, that one you spelled and that was good. Okay, great. This is fantastic. Oh, what? Where, where exactly are you located in California? Laurel Canyon oh. in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, would, would you happen to know um, the, the uh, gosh, what it's called the birdhouse? Um, no, but I heard about it. I can't wait to go check it out. Yeah. Oh, a guy absolutely. Who you for need my to. congressman, a guy who works for my congressman told me about it. And when you're there, 
um, talk to Keisha and Casey Wheeler. They are two of our people who make really good compost. At and the birdhouse? At the birdhouse. I'm yep. going there. I'm going to go. I can't wait. And I'll talk to him and I'll learn about it. Thank you. That's super awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. This is yep. so fun. So great. Okay. All righty. Great. Um, a great respite after your trip to Brazil and a great trip when you're ready to go to Southeast Asia or Southeast Asia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you so much. Have a beautiful rest of your day. And I, I'm just so thankful. I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. And I hope everybody who's listening gets some compost and some mulch and, and a microscope. And we find out what's going on in our soils and make it better and make the food better and make the rain better and the soil more more healthy and able to sequester water and and also healthy soil sequesters um carbon and also healthy grasses ameliorate methane so like we have a solution let's do it yep. thank you let's not have any anaerobic dirt anywhere because that's where things like methane um the the alcohols the terpenes the tannins that are so difficult to deal with we don't want to allow that situation unless it's absolutely necessary and how do you find out like are you using a ph strip you take some soil and you put it in water and then you use a ph strip to find it um typically what we're what we're using is our nose because all of those compounds ha are bad smells they're anaerobic they smell bad and as soon as you smell those bad anaerobic materials you want to do something to get the oxygen back into that material. So you're basically picking up some soil and smelling it. And that's how you know. That's how you know. And the way to get the oxygen back into the soil is to turn it. Take a pitchfork, take a shovel, and you're going to have to mix, mix that so that the oxygen can get back into. Uh, I know it's you know, especially if things are smelling really bad, you have to do something about it right now. Um, otherwise, if you don't have that, um, you can take a like a broom handle and just punch holes down into that area that the bad smells are coming from because that's going to get oxygen down to the bottom. That's so fascinating. I'm going to go smell my soil. Pick it up. And as you try to pick it up and your fingers hit something, you know, you, you can't go any deeper than two inches. Uh oh, mm -hmm. you've got compacted soil and you need to get that biology back in there. And so, the biology uncompacts it with the root system and the fungi and the, all those creatures. Yep, absolutely. The bacteria start making the micro aggregates, the fungi build the macro um, aggregates. So now you have the airways and the passageways and the hallways and the uh, pores that I also like to think of it as the uh, dining rooms and the you know castles and the cathedrals. They're all there. Airflow is going to be great. So and we have to rebuild studio. it. Yeah, art studio too. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has to be there because you don't have cathedrals without art. You don't have dining rooms often without art you know this it has to be and i think this is such an art nature is so artistic yes so genius okay i'm gonna let you go thank okay. you so much thank you okay so i really appreciate you yep. thank <laughs> you very much karen all right thanks elaine bye-bye